All right, guys, listen up, listen up. It's a beautiful day in Ridgewood, New York, and this is the kitchen bike mechanic in his kitchen. Uh, we got Mama here, we got Betty here. They know what's going on. It's a special day. I've been presented with a uh, rare opportunity to make some juicy content for you guys uh, to help us along the way. We've got a couple implements for measurement. Got a Stanley tape measure. A little cheapo vernier and a uh, Amazon fine non-part tool model super cheap fishing scale and uh, I've been presented with a rare opportunity uh, because last week I got this guy in the mail and this is a size 54 S works tarmac SL4 so what is the rare opportunity exactly you might be asking well i have stripped down my size 54 sl5 tarmac uh which i have been riding around on and have had built up in various uh configurations for the past like six or seven months uh and they're both completely stripped down um, we're going to be doing a side-by-side -side comparison today. So I think when it was originally uh, introduced, the SL5 was kind of criticized for being, you know, kind of identical in geometry to the SL4. And you can kind of see that a little bit. Uh, you know, the only real difference between these frames aside from subtle tube shaping is the seat collar situation so the SL4 has a very traditional kind of unintegrated seat collar mechanism uh, you know there's a little more seat tube sticking out and uh, traditional seat collar whereas the SL5 has a in an integrated seat clamp mechanism and that is inside the frame and you can see I have a piece of tape over this because by the way if you own an SL5 frame and you've ever had to change your seat post you know that thing can uh it's first off it's a pain in the ass to get it in there in the first place second off if it's uh if you pull your seat post out a little too quick and your bike's leaning the wrong way it will fall out this little divot in there uh, which this tape is covering and potentially go down your seat tube and get wedged down there forever uh, and there are various videos on YouTube showing how to extract that thing or you know kind of giving you a precautionary uh, advice uh, so yeah and I have a replacement one of those just in case because they are like a proprietary part that are hard to get your hands on uh, and I try to take as much precaution as possible. Um, you can see here there's like a little rubber plug. And if you pull that out, uh, you can access the bolt to, you know, tighten the seat clamp, seat clamp down. Uh, you know, I think modern bikes are criticized pretty heavily for, you know, having integrated everything. Uh, you know, integrated headsets at this point are very standard, you know kind of outboard, you know, press in cups, you know, are kind of the way of the dodo at this point. Uh, the SL4 does not have that, which, uh, you know, I really appreciate actually. You know, I'm a DIY home bike mechanic. Uh, I enjoy working on my bikes almost as much as I enjoy riding them. And I appreciate when things are, uh, you know, pretty easy to work with and uncomplicated. Uh, both of these bikes feature internal cable, uh, cable routing, uh, which if you have the right tools and you know what you're doing, doesn't have to be the biggest pain in the ass in the world, but it still can be. Uh, so what are you gonna do? And the cable routing patterns on this are very similar. You know, you've got your two down tube uh, entrances there. Uh, when this frame first arrived, you know, all of the shifter kind of ferrules were like plugged up with some kind of epoxy. 
Uh, and my guess is that this was ran either with the I2 or with uh, an electronic SRAM group set, which you can do with this frame. Uh, and on both of these frames, you can kind of observe some little rubber plugs strategically located in the frames. Uh, does the SL5, doesn't have one there. It's got one down here. So if you're thinking about getting an SL5 or an SL4, uh, that's an option for you. It's probably a little more complicated. Um, you know, I think modern road bikes have the junction boxes like placed in the seat posts or kind of under the handlebars. Uh, you can kind of sort it out. So it appears to me that both of these bikes have the same derailleur hanger. Uh, and I think anyone who's owned bikes long enough and has cared to maintain them themselves. Oh man, anyone who's had a stripped down frame understands how hard it is to like stand these things up sometimes. Uh, anyone who's kind of worked on their own bikes understands how much of a pain in the ass it can be to find a replacement derailleur hanger. Luckily these are both appearing to be pretty straight. And I know some good websites you can find some replacements. Um, it's not always the biggest deal in the world. Uh, both of these feature the tapered fork integrated headset design. And so it's an uh, inch and an eighth at the top. And I think on the bottom of both of these frames, it's an inch and a quarter. Now, don't quote me on that because I could be wrong. And uh, another one of the main differences between the SL4 and the SL5 was that the SL5 kind of introduced this uh, uh, rider specific body geometry concept where different sized frames had different geometry to kind of make a more even uh, kind of performance scale, you know? So if like you're running a size 61 centimeter frame, it would kind of behave the same as a size 50. Uh, which I guess, you know, if you were a size 50 or a size 61, you would appreciate. But I've heard it said, and I don't know if it's true that, you know, kind of the uh, kind of medium sizes, like the 54, like these, 56 and 58 were kind of left alone. So if you were like, if you were a size 56 and debating like upgrading to the SL5, aside from the, you know, integrated seat post and the disc brake option, you know, wasn't really too much difference. And that's the thing about the SL5. It was the first tarmac to feature disc brakes. It wasn't the first specialized road bike to feature disc brakes. I think that was the Route A SL4. But this is obviously the rim brake model. Uh, Rim brakes. What else can be said in differences here? Uh, the forks are slightly different. SL4 fork seems a little more, uh, you know, there's a little more like curvature rake to it. As the SL5 seems a lot more, uh, it looks a little beefier. Maybe I'm imagining that. Hmm. Uh, the cable routing, internal cable routing hole in the top tube on the SL5 is also a lot larger than the SL4. And the only reason I know that off the top of my head is because I just ordered a replacement kind of cable routing stop because I think this is, when I find this online, it says it's a hydraulic uh cable routing stop thing which is curious to me did someone have hydraulic rim brakes on this thing maybe i don't understand something here uh i was i was talking about forks before a tapered head tube so the sl5 i mentioned had that scaling uh geometry so i think the larger frames 
feature different forks. And if you go to buy a replacement fork for the, you know these bikes, you'll see that the forks have sizes. Uh, so if you're 61 centimeter, you know your fork. I, I think the bottom race, the bearing is going to be a different size than the 54 here. So be aware of that. If you're looking for an aftermarket fork or a replacement on eBay or something, you know, think about that for a second. Uh, I don't know if this speaks at all about the model series, but these bikes have two different steer tube plugs in them. Uh, this is one of the really nice uh, specialized design steer tube plugs. That's like one piece. It slots in and, you know, you just tighten it up to the torque spec. And if you want to untighten it a little bit and pop it out in one piece. I really appreciate that design. And I've got one of those laying around. Uh, my desk is a mess right now because I have two stripped down bikes. Uh, I have three stripped down bikes actually. Is that the Roubaix over there too? Yeah, here's one of those steer two plugs. And I was excited to, uh, because I saw this wasn't one of them and this is a brand new plug. I was excited to extract that and put this in there. But unfortunately, in this beautiful SL4, it's got some bunk ass plug that I kind of just can't get out. And it's concerning me because, you know, I don't want to have to take a mallet to this thing. Um, but you know, that's the state of things. Uh, what's another difference I can talk about here? The bottom brackets, oh my God. I can rant for hours about fucking specialized bottom brackets. Uh, oh, I mentioned so well, before that, you know, cable routing. Uh, you know, these are both internally routed cables. And I think the SL4 was the first tarmac to do that. The SL3 kind of had the frame bosses on the side. Uh, it might have had an internal top tube. Uh, you know, rear brake cable routing situation. But these are both, like, kind of identical. Uh, aside from the... You know, kind of the cable guides on the bottom bracket. I'm like afraid to lift this frame up to show this right now because I know that headset's loose. But uh, you know, it's it's got the standard opening for the front door. But you can see there uh, the cable routing situation. Uh, you know, this little bolt there with like a. Uh, Kind of a securing device that can be removed i guess you wouldn't really need that or maybe that bolt actually secures that entire piece and, and the so 5 you know has that same you know just little hole for the front derailleur mm -hmm. cable and this guide is kind of molded in and this frame actually came with uh, a carbon cover to cover this entire plate. So it's like smooth and unexposed. I don't have that in right now. I don't know. I didn't think it was necessary. Uh, you know, I'm constantly recabling my bikes and in my mind, it kind of added more weight. It's the inner weight weenie in me. It doesn't need excessive shit hanging off my bike so yeah here's the bottom back bottom bracket situation uh i don't remember if it was the sl3 or the sl4 that was the first specialized to feature the osbb uh which is kind of a kind of a fake stand like kind of a bunk uh fake standard because it's not a real proprietary standardization um you know specialized road bikes are either bb30 or pf30 uh which this sl5 is a bb30 uh it's got these kind of i think aluminum or or delrin cups permanently bonded into the frame <clears throat> 
and the uh, bottom bracket I run on this is a BB30 wheels manufacturing bottom bracket that I've removed, you know, for the sake of uh, the weighing we're gonna do later. And the uh, S-Works SL4 has these press fit cups uh, epoxied into this frame. So that's non-permanent, hopefully, because I wanna take those out. But the shell itself is a PF30 shell. And I believe both of the, the shell widths on these bikes are 61 millimeters. And I think maybe that's the only thing that makes these like OSBB kind of proprietary, you know, measurements. Otherwise, you know, they fit 6806 bearings into the cups of these frames or in some frames into the raw shell. Uh, if you have a tarmac or any specialized bike where instead of, you know, any carbon in here, if you see just aluminum all the way through, like a aluminum shell in there, that's gonna be a BB30. Uh, be aware of that. Um, I had a SL4 Pro frame that had a BB30 aluminum shell situation in there. And I used the same bottom bracket that I use on this SL5 in that frame. Uh, so the bottom bracket on this bike is kind of the speed bump in me getting this built up because uh, I really want to knock these epoxy cups out. And like when you hear like something's epoxy done, you might think it's permanent. Um, and this is some super bike nerd advanced mechanic shit that might be over my head, but, you know, as I understand, just, you know, the epoxy isn't a permanently bonding this in there. So theoretically, these can be knocked out. Uh, I'm not going to do that myself. You know, I have a limit of, you know, my mechanical know-how and kind of ballsiness when it comes to doing home bike mechanic stuff. Uh, and I'd, I'd like to explore that option. Uh, there is a 6806 bearing still in the right side uh, that I'm gonna knock out soon. And I'll take this down to the local bike shop and see what they can do for it, you know. Uh, I could explore, you know, putting some new bearings in there and running some shims for uh, the Shimano crank sets that I like to run. Uh, you know, I haven't decided what I'm gonna do with that yet. Um, but yeah, bottom brackets, specialized bikes, you know, it's a thing. Anyone who owns a specialized bike or built up a frame, uh, you know, knows that's a thing. And I wish there was more information out there on it, so. I intend to do another video that kind of just focuses on that. I guess we can kind of like <clears throat> get into the details of the differences in the frame geometry and tube shapes here. Uh, let's start with the rear kind of seat stay situation. Uh, up towards the top, it looks a bit chunkier on the SL4. Um, SL5, where it meets the seat post, is a bit narrower. Seat stays. The chain stays look more or less identical. Uh, <clears throat> both of these bikes are 11R carbon, by the way, or carbon composite which is specialized, you know, FACT 11R, functional advanced carbon something, uh, which is their, you know, proprietary blend of carbon and other materials to create the composite from which these frames are molded. Uh, so they're both, both 11R. Uh, I think 12R was introduced with uh, SL6, which I would love to get my hands on. You know, I would drop both of these bikes for a S-Works SL6 run break. And if I see a good deal on one in the future, I would definitely hop on that. 
uh, I think the top tubes are shaped a little differently. You can see on the SO4, it's the SO4 and SO3 are kind of famous for their Cobra head curved top tube. <clears throat> SO5 top tube seems a little straighter and you can see on their uh, paint jobs, you know, not this one, obviously it's murdered out. Uh, you know, they kind of accentuate that a bit. You know, I guess the lines were designed to be a little more angular. And you can see that in the divot to the, uh, the shifter cable internal route angle was there. Like, it's kind of pointy right there. A little more around there. Um, the down tube on the SL5 is a little more flat up top. I'm not sure what that does for uh, stiffness. Maybe nothing. It's probably just aesthetics. Geometry is the same. Of course, the down tube on the SL4 is just a giant beefy tube which really appeals to me. I mean, like, it's just a huge, chunky carbon tube. <laughs> you know, I really, the SL4, you know, when I was first getting into carbon road bikes, something about this frame, like, really appealed to me. Like, the size of the tubes and the flowing lines, it's very, uh, how do I say this? Very like voluptuous, <laughs> you know. You could, it, and I saw a video from like Cycling Weekly or something that said, you know, it used a lot of keywords that I kind of, you know, kind of follow me, like um, beefy and uh, curvaceous, and I guess that's very much an American aesthetic when it comes to frame design, you know? So, Tarmax in general are probably the coolest looking bikes in my opinion, particularly the uh, SL4, SL6. Too. So uh, I guess that's enough of my rambling on kind of the aesthetics and the visual differences between these bikes. I uh, kind of gone over some practical differences. Um, so, I guess why everyone is here is to see these boys weighed up comparatively. And I do have to tell you, um, you know, they're identically stripped down except for one exception. As you can see here, there's a FD9100 still attached to this frame, and that's for a reason because uh, they're pretty faffy to set up, and then it feels like taking it off and resetting it. Uh, so when we weigh these, I'll take that into account because I know exactly how much this weighs. Uh, I've weighed it before. Um, what else has to be said? Um, you know, they both have the seat clamp. This one's internal. That one's on the frame, uh, so we'll keep that in mind. Uh, they both kind of have the same. Um, well, this one's actually a little longer, the uh, exposed there too. Neither of them have spacers on, and they have pretty much identical headsets. Uh, this one's got two S-Works bolts in it, two generic bolts. This one has four S-Works bolts in it. This one still has that, uh, you know, BB30-6806 bearing on the other side. This one is completely raw on the inside, so uh, we'll take that into account, too. But aside from that, you know, identical. So that front derailleur weighs 71 grams. Uh, let's get to the weighing here. <laughs> I had these out like I was going to use them to measure the frame geometry or something and maybe that would have been a good idea but I think I've rambled enough this video is too long at that point <clears throat> at this point rather all right I love doing this kind of stuff um, 
make sure the scale is zeroed out. This fucking Hida Amazon phone fishing scale. All right. Try to find the sweet spot there. That ain't it. I fear doing this with SL4 because. All right, SL5, 1520. <clears throat> We're zeroed out and gonna weigh the SL4 now. What's going on over there, guys? Chill out. 1520 for the SL5, which is minus 71 grams. 1449 and I'm gonna do the SO4 here if that headset can hold that fork for a second that'd be really nice find the sweet spot Fourteen, fourteen thirty, fourteen twenty five, fourteen thirty, fourteen twenty five. I'm gonna call it fourteen twenty five. Uh, <clears throat> so. I'm kind of processing that information in my head right now. Uh, you know, I'm kind of not surprised that S-Works SL4 is lighter. Um, I kind of heard, I read some forums that suggested that SL5 is actually a little heavier. And at 1449, 1435, you know, SL4 is lighter by like, you know, 15 grams or something silly like that uh and uh, you know if that uh you know i don't know exactly how much that bearing weighs in there uh that factored in you know that probably does weigh like 15 grams or something uh you know this this bike is 20 or 30 grams lighter than the so5 uh which i'm kind of not surprised honestly for some reason i kind of anticipated that and that's why you know the second I got this frame I intended to build it up as like my lightweight climbing bike and migrate all of my lighter components onto this one and have this one be more like my general purpose frame that I'm not afraid to bang around a little bit uh you know it's murdered out and it's matte black paint job you can kind of get away with this getting a little dirtier uh, so, 1449, 1350, what was it again, actually? 1435, actually. Let's do that one more time. All right, guys, so this is going to be the third time I've weighed these frames, but just for the sake of accuracy, I figured I'd break out the uh, Bed Bath & Beyond Finds non-part tool scale. And this is going to be difficult to do, but I've seen it done before by other YouTubers, and it's just about finding the right balance. You know, originally I didn't want to disassemble these headsets and forks. Um, so we got 15, 13, the full headset in the frame, the fork there, the FD9100 C clamp, that's the SL5.
1513. I'll write that down. All right, now we're gonna try the SO4. Fourteen twenty one. Now that's with the full headset in there. You know that sixty eight oh six bearing in there, just like I talked about everything as it was assembled before. Fourteen twenty. I like to think this is going to be a bit more accurate of a measurement. Uh, so yeah. Start the side for now. And, uh, living room mechanics couch. All right, guys, forgive the sound of my dishwasher in the last clip, but uh, you know we're in the kitchen. So I've got this uh, 6902 bearing that I'm kind of weighing as a reference. Obviously, the 6806 press fit BB30 bearing is going to be a little heavier. I'm not exactly sure how much, but I estimate, you know, five or so grams. Uh, as a conservative estimate, I wrote down here 16 grams. Uh, you know, so the SL5 total weight was 1513 grams minus 71 for the FD9100 derailleur. So the net weight on that boy was 1442 grams. Uh, SO4 total weight was 1420 minus about 16, give or take a couple grams for the uh, 6806 bearing that's still in there. And that gives us a total weight of 1404. Uh, like I said before, you know, I. I try to weigh things a bunch of times just for the sake of accuracy. I'm not going to average them together, but you know, I like to think these tabletop scales are a little more accurate. I was about to say earlier, you know, kudos to Specialized for kind of updating these frame sets and kind of still keeping them the same weight. Uh, and, you know, your frame might be a little heavier than mine or a little lighter than mine. Uh, but for some reason, I expected the SL4 to be a little lighter, and uh, I was right. Despite it having, uh, you know, an external seat clamp, you know, a taller seat tube, you know, I thought one of the reasons for the integrated seat clamp design was to make it lighter, but you know, whatever. Uh, you know, they both have brazons. This guy's got like some metal ferrules built into the frame. You know, these, uh, these, uh, steer tube plugs, you know, this one's probably lighter on this SL5. Um, you know, I guess that stuff can be taken into account. But, I mean, regardless, everything on this SL4 appears like it would be heavier um and it's lighter which i'm just fine with because this is gonna be you know my my performance climbing race bike so uh yeah uh thank you very much for watching this video guys i hope you enjoyed it i hope it scratched some kind of Wait, we need itch. If you're a specialized fan, I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, and I hope this video is not too long, but you know, with a rare opportunity to compare two similar frames of the same size side by side, you know, I couldn't pass up this opportunity. So, uh, thanks again for viewing, guys. And, uh, 
get out there and ride a bike and be a weight weenie if you want to because who cares i am <laughs>